because I mean, were you were you on the boats and things when you were filming that business with the solitaire with it menacing overhead and the the uh, the Irish Navy and what have you? Yeah. Were you, were you were right, you were right there, were you? I was, yeah. Well, I I pretty much filmed it all except the aerials and the um, the archive stuff at the start. Um, so and you a very were part small of it very much then. Sorry, you were very much part of it. All. Well, absolutely, yeah. You yeah. see. I, I, I lived in the community. My uncle was a farmer there and I was living with him. And uh, I had a small camera about that size. It's called a Sony Z1. It's HDV. And I would have filmed, did all my own filming, and I would have had, uh, put little radio microphones on people. So it wasn't like a sound man <coughs> with a big boom. And the guard I didn't mind. But you see, I was always there, you know, and I kind of knew everyone on first name terms. In the community meetings, they took no notice of me on the protests. You know, I was just always there, like so. Mm. It wasn't like a news crew or a TV crew that come yeah. up. It was just like me with a camera. Um, and it, it was, I was lucky I didn't have a sound man because with the little radio mics, you put them onto somebody and they, they, they forget they're being recorded. You know, they forget they're wearing them. And like when Willie Cardoff was being arrested by the Garda and the Garda's trying to put his hand behind his back. Uh, you know, you could pick up the whole conversation like, and I see Willie going off being arrested and I, and he goes, there goes another one of my microphones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Realising that it was actually real gold that was being picked up by it. So um, I suppose it was because I had to film it on a very, pretty much no budget, until the film board and the TG4 broadcaster came in for the post-production stage. For filming it, uh, I was doing it off my own bat, so it made me kind of be, was creative when it comes to filming it. And that led to it actually breaking down a lot of barriers with the community because I didn't have the resources for a film crew, so I had to do it just myself. And, you know, they didn't see me as a, as a filmmaker. It was just kind of Richie. Were they pleased when they saw it at the end? Um, most of them were. Some of it was hard to watch. Yeah. Maura Harrington got stuck into me after the first <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> But, like, as I explained, I mean, I showed Maura, I showed all of her colours, and we, we, didn't, we didn't try and sensation her in the community meetings. That's what she's like. She's, you know, she is like that. There's no kind of clever editing at play there. Um, but I mean, her biggest fear was being ignored or not being in the film. I'd say. So she's kind of come around to it, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kept her in the spotlight because she's, you know, she probably would have a lot. She a lot of her mentality would be about control and her own bringing her own uh, ideologies into the protest. Whereas to kind of most of the local people. It's their, their health, their safety, their environment. That's what they're focused on. Where Maura has kind of a lot more political and ideological baggage, which she tries to, to, to bring into the campaign, which is a problem too for, I mean, a lot of campaigns in this country too, I imagine. You know, if you've, if you've campaigns that are based on very kind of genuine principles, it's, I mean, it's very hard not to attract the kind of the, the nutball element, which can be a problem. Because what I saw down in Carib is you'd have a protest day and, and you'd have a few people come from outside, they'd hear about the protest, and they'd bring their own baggage in, you know? Mm -hmm. And the media would always focus <coughs> on those people. You know, here, here are these anarchists, or here are these Republicans, or here are these people who are, you know, have a, a, are looking to attack the state. And, and that would give the media and Shell an excuse to completely distract from the real issues on the ground. And that was kind of a failing of media that I saw in Carroll. And you know, I, I see it a lot, like, say, say over here, I, I know you had student protests a while back, mm -hmm. and there was a small element who, who, who got kind of pushy and shovey and it was window smashed. And, of course, Sky News and helicopters and everything, they focus in on that. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the real issue about students' fees goes out the window. And the story of the day, then, is violence on the streets, you know, students fighting with police. Um, so that, you know, that was, that was something that I felt, which is the advantage of documentary, you can actually get into a subject. And you, you know you have you have a lot of time to to be able to introduce the more academic stuff like Europe here and the planning process and the courts. You have time to, to, to introduce that as well, as well as the more dramatic stuff and the sensational stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that TV news and, and to a large extent newspapers as well um, don't get into these days. Can I ask you, Richie, how how have um, how have Shell reacted to the film? Have you felt pressure from Shell and they've tried to keep you quiet? <laughs> No, they offered me a job, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, uh, when I was filming for news, um, and then I was also doing a bit on, you know, filming the documentary, um, the head of Shell Communications, the former 
RTE, that's our national broadcaster, and he's a former BBC journalist also. Um, and he actually reported on the, the hanging of Ken Sarawiwa, the Nigerian activist at the behest of Shell um, in, the, in the 90s, back in Nigeria for BBC, and subsequently ends up being head of communications for Shell, which is very convenient. So um, I'd meet him on news reports, you know, very polished, very slick, and um, and were able to work the media as well, like, and, you know, bully them or cajole them. Uh, but, you know, he, he was there, well, you know, we have kind of media work, because they're always putting DVDs in people's doors and, you know, <laughs> shiny brochures, and he asked me, did it, would, would I do some work on that, you know? But I kind of, I refused, like, and he eventually got a different, actually, a news cameraman again to, to do that. So they're very clever in how they build up these connections with the media, very subtly, you know? Um, but um, since we launched the film, it's kind of been a brick wall from Shell, you know? Uh, they, they don't say very much about it. The thing is, I mean, I haven't tried to tell Shell's story. It's not necessarily a film about Shell. It's about a community um, who've been deserted by their state. Their own government has turned their backs on them and allowed them to be treated like second-class citizens. And their own, their own government has manipulated the laws of the country, has interfered with the planning process, has turned their own local police force against them. And that's, that's really, I can think, the, the, the heart of the story, you know? Um, we, I did, Shell did come on, the, the head of communications did come on the kind of a debate with me on radio. And his, his kind of reaction was kind of funny. He said, it's a beautiful film. And as a male man myself, I think the place looks great. But it's completely one-sided. And by my dishonest storytelling and not telling Shell's side, it's, it's just completely unbalanced. Which is true because I mean I, I bent over backwards to try and get them involved, and if they, if they if they wouldn't participate, of course it's going to be imbalanced. So I mean that was just there wasn't any other film I could make, but at least by showing the community side, I tried to show it warts and all, show the their weaknesses and their faults as well as their, um, their their good points, and because that was the side of the story that I felt was lost. I mean Shell's story was coming through people's letterboxes on their TVs every day. The government side, they were able to get their story out. You know, the Gardaí press, the police press office. But it was the local story that really I kind of, I kind of didn't get kind of proper, proper airing and wasn't shown honestly. And you know, that was the the number one aim to allow these people not to tell their story for them. Like there's no experts, there's no voiceover, but it was allow these people the space to tell their own story. That that's that's just what it is, really.